Namaskar. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. Joining me today is Professor M. D. Nalapat and we're going to be talking about the Moscow attack. What was the role of Pakistan's deep state? Because more details are now emerging and it appears that there was a hand of Pakistan's deep state in this. How this comes in and how Ukraine comes into all this. Let's listen from the good professor. Professor Nalapat, Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. Namaskar Sri, Namaskar. Uh, Professor Nalapat, very interesting article today on the Sunday Guardian. Viewers, I encourage you to read it. I will put that link in the references section of uh, in the reference uh, portion of the description section. I'll, I yield the floor to you, Professor Nalapat. Go back a little bit because these days you are getting a lot of assassins for hire. How can one say that this has got the footprint of Pakistan's deep state in it? Well, uh, I'd like to say that. Uh, any crime, there is evidence. There is no crime without evidence. And there will be telltale signs of that evidence. Now, Abhinandan Mishra, the who, who wrote that particular front page item for Sunday Guardian, he has extensive contacts in a number of uh, places. Places that, frankly, she, you and I would hesitate to go into. Individuals uh, who, uh, frankly, that you and I may hesitate to meet or be in contact with. Abhinandan has got contact. He does meet them. He talks to them. And several exceptionally good reports have come out, uh, almost all of which have been corroborated subsequently. So he's a very credible writer. And he has uncovered a lot of evidence, uh, basically linking elements in the Pakistan deep state. We're not talking about an organization or an or a, basically an effort by the by by the, the the any particular institution in the deep state we're talking about elements of the deep state involved in the training and equipping of the very if i may say so well equipped and if i may say so excellently trained from a tactical standpoint for of this particular mission they were very well trained from a tactical standpoint they were excellently equipped and according to Abhinandan's front page story, well, the the link leads to elements in GHQ Rawalpindi. Now, the fact is that we all know that uh, the Pakistan military cultivates a large garden of terrorists. Uh, I mean, it's it's not uh, it's not a secret that they do that. And of course, the point is that their obsession is India. Their obsession is the breakup of India. Their obsession is to cause violence and mayhem in India. And the, the jihadis all over the world are now taking advantage of their obsession to basically contact them and say, look, we don't like India as well, especially we, are, we, are, you know, we would like to go against India. And so please help us. Now, these people are so blinded by hatred of India. I'm talking of... Uh, what you and I uh, in, in this particular show uh, is calling the Pakistan deep state, that they basically, um, uh, uh, you know, in many cases, they don't do much of, in terms of uh, verifying whether it is authentic that their motivation is like that or some other motivation. And frankly, they couldn't care. They couldn't care who, who or what is being attacked, provided, of course, is not two countries, United States and China. Both these countries are off limits to activities of GHQ Rawalpindi. Uh, of course, they are not off limits to activities of other groups. But these two, uh, for, so far as Pakistan GHQ is concerned, they are very clear that these are the two guardians, if I may say so, of GHQ Rawalpindi, and they're off limits. Now, barring that, they don't care if these people attack any other country, but provided they also attack India. So Abhinandan has had multiple discussions with people. He has worked out, uh, you know, he has connected the dots. He has got his uh, his contacts to help him connect the dots. And he is absolutely clear. He's up. I mean, I questioned him several times on that. I asked him for a certain amount of substantiation. And uh, he, he is convinced. And in my view, it's a very credible hypothesis that uh, elements of the Pakistan D state were involved in the training and equipping of this group. One thing is very clear. I don't believe Ukraine 
would assuming that the Ukrainians are involved in this. Now, Sri, here we are again, we are going very much into the field of speculation. The reality, of course, is the Ukrainians are desperate. The war is not going well for them. They are open to asymmetric methods. This is a very asymmetric method. They have completely, they are in a way like the Pakistan military is blinded by hate of India. They are blinded by hate of Russia and specifically uh, of President Putin. I mean, they, I think somebody gave the wrong impression to the CIA and various other Western intelligence agencies about the stability and longevity of, of Putin in power. Well, after a, a more than 700 days of this war, I think it's becoming very clear those initial estimates that he will be blown away like uh, you know chaff in, in the breeze is wrong. So they are blinded by hate of Putin. And let's face it, this attack has been a terrible blow to the reputation of Vladimir Putin. There's no getting away from it. There's absolutely no getting away from it. The fact that about 200 people died and we are seeing the death count climb start steadily, it'll probably be more than 200. The fact that this kind of a attack took place in the capital of Russia, in in a in a in a place frequented by uh, by individuals by ordinary citizens of Russia, and frankly, a lot of them would have, would be would have been pro uh, Putin. Now, I mean, it, it is uh, this entire attack. It was intended to damage the reputation of President Putin. Not forget about the globe, certainly within Russia as a strong man capable of protecting the interests of Russia. This attack was de designed with that express purpose. The location, the methods, the, the, the means, the if impact, all that had has definitely had a huge adverse effect on the, on the perception of the persona of President Putin as a strong man the man who can protect you, the man who can keep you safe, you know, trust Vladimir Putin. Now, after this attack, it is as though the attackers are saying, can you trust him anymore? This is what we did. And can you trust him anymore? So frankly, I mean, again, I would like to say, I'm not getting into any assertion of fact. I'm simply saying circumstantially, there is no doubt that Ukraine has, the, the Ukrainian leadership has the level of animus against President Putin so great that it could very well have been incentivized to carry out this kind of an attack. Now, if that is the case, they would obviously not have done. They would have been very careful to keep any Ukrainian uh, fingerprint on that. Whether, of course, these uh, individuals uh, went in the direction of Kiev, obviously because they were not suicide bombers, they were mercenaries. They wanted money and you want money for a better life. You don't want money, well, I mean, when you're about to uh, kill yourself, honestly. It makes no difference. So, the, barring that, it is, they, it is, I think, that they were very careful, assuming it was them, to leave no fingerprint, a Ukrainian fingerprint, on the attackers or on those who equipped them, those who funded them, etc., etc., etc. Now, of course, the FSB, after this particular act, has gone into operation. Frankly, uh, I'm a little surprised that the FSB did not uh, detect this earlier. But the, that is the problem with terrorism, Sri. You can detect 999 terror attacks and save an umpteen number of people. But one guy who gets through blows up your reputation with smithereens. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm, I, I get the idea that Ukraine probably had a, a roundabout way to get this thing to inflict upon Russia. I'm still searching for the India connection here. Are you saying that there is a part two of this episode it to happen and that could be in India? Look, I don't believe the Ukrainians are at all interested in uh, launching any kind of an attack on, on India. A terror attack, certainly not. I don't believe that. They are obsessed with the uh, with Europe. They're obsessed with Russia. I don't believe the Ukrainians are planning any kind of an attack on India. Uh, Foreign Minister Kuleba was was here, in, was in, in, in Delhi, in the na uh, national capital recently. And he tried very hard to persuade India to try and adopt a stance, which in effect would be, 
would would be anti-Russia. And there has been a lot of temptation by various players to try and tempt India into becoming a quote-unquote peacemaker. The fact is, peacemaking is not possible. Peacemaking, from the Ukrainian point of view, the Russians were drawing from all their territories. The Russians, after having gone through this kind of agony, they're not going to do that. And these are uh, many, most of these territories are where they have been since 2014, after the Maidan coup. So it's not going to happen. So I don't believe that India is at any risk of Ukraine doing this kind of thing. But yes, we are and we were and we will be at risk of the deep state of Pakistan carrying out uh, uh, attacks. And I think it's a tribute to our security uh, agencies that we are they're doing, a, if I may say so, a very good job of keeping the country safe from this, frankly, this particular institution that is breeds monsters routinely and is protected by the United States and China. There's one issue on which the US and China both come together. And one reason is that the United States and China both benefit from Pakistan in different ways. From the United States point of view, possibly they're talking about Intel, uh, for, about China. The Chinese point of view, of course, India is very much front and center. They have got a very big interest in weakening India. So these two countries are basically the protectors of Pakistan, despite the fact that Pakistan itself, uh, through its deep state, is the protector of a nest of terrorists. Professor Nalapat, the United States did issue a warning to Russia of an impending terror attack. Um, so, if they wanted this to go through, why would they issue that warning? Sri, let me say very clearly that, look, first of all, I mean, I'm not going to say the United States is behind it. I am. I mean, it could very well be that some extreme mercenary forces were behind it, uh, from motivated by, uh, I would say, the, 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 the needless suspicion points to Ukraine, and they did it for money. There are only two countries that Pakistan, frankly, uh, you know, responds to. And one is the United States, partly, and the other is China, partly. So I'm not saying the United States is behind it. But this so-called warning was a joke. What they said was, to US nationals staying in Moscow, please be careful about you know, the possibility of a terror attack. Avoid crowded locations, such as shopping malls. What they were essentially saying was, what Biden was saying was, go to the basement. Behave as though you're back in the lockdown of the COVID-19 period. Go into the basement. Don't step out. Don't go to crowded places. God, you go on a pavement. You go into a metro. I mean, you get onto a road. You're in a crowded place. So frankly, this is hardly a warning. I mean, I can tell you, uh, I mean, I can warn every country in the world, be careful about a terror attack. And uh, uh, if, unfortunately, any of these countries have a terror attack, I can then come on your show and say, look, I warned you. The fact of the matter is, of course, uh, if you've got uh, slightly, if I may say so, the kind of mind that an intelligence officer would have, which you and I don't have, then you will, you know, this is a good deniability uh, mechanism. You first, you know something is going on. You then warn the target country in a way which, frankly, they will not take seriously. And then you say, look, I told you so. So uh, this particular warning, Sri, frankly, it doesn't hold water from the evidentiary point of view. And again, I'm repeating, I'm not sure that it could have been the United States. If it were a country were involved in either the United States or China. Now you'll ask, why China? Yes, it's counterfactual to say that, you know, the, the child, uh, Putin is so close to Xi, Russia is so close to China. But the fact is, the CCP leadership, she wants a weak and weakened leader. Putin just came back from a 70% plus victory in the polls. He was immensely strengthened by the polls. This particular event has knocked him flat, has taken, you know, if I may say so, the, the, the shine of Putin. And it's always easier for the CCP leadership and for Xi to deal with the leader on the defensive. That's why she is delighted that you guys, I mean, the United States, uh, Germany, France, UK, Poland, Lithuania, you name it, they're all going after Putin. In the process, she is, I, I just, 
I mean, ignored, frankly, as a threat, except for routine assertions here and there, which mean nothing. In effect, it's Putin now. That's front and center of your attention. And that is something that she loves. He welcomes that. So quite frankly, uh, you know, uh, a weakened Putin is much better for Xi Jinping than a strong Putin. And definitely a Putin that has come back with 70% of the Russian vote is not a partner that the Chinese would like. They would like partners who basically say, you guys are right, we'll do what you want. And then that is playing the rules of the game. And may I remind you, that is what the United States used to do before Pax Americana ended. It's ended now. There's no Pax Americana. As yet, thank God, there's no Pax Seneca. Hopefully, there never will be. But that's what exactly what the Americans did. I mean, basically, your way is not your way. My way or the highway. Your way has to be my way. And that's it. That is now the, a lot of American concepts have been adopted by the CCP. This is one of them. And that is to Putin also that, look, what we want, you carry out. And if you're a strong leader and you resent that and Putin is a nationalist, he's a Russian nationalist. I don't think, I think he frankly, you know, correctly believes Russia is also a great power on par with China. So is India. So is the United States. Although Europeans never classify India as a great power, nor do uh, the, the Chinese, nor do the Americans. The Russians sometimes do. But they're also a great power. So from that point of view, a weakened Putin plays into uh, their interests. So again, hypothetically, one of these two countries could have done it or some or a country motivated by or a very, you know, uh, uh, what do I say, very well-resourced individual motivated by the obvious cult, I mean, the obvious suspect, Ukraine, you know, the usual suspect, let's put it that way, could have done it. So I, I'm not saying who did it, but these three could have done it. It could also have been a fourth. We don't know. An entirely different thing. But the fact is, the fact that this was designed expressly to humiliate Vladimir Putin, I think the needle of suspicion is very much on the Ukrainian side. And both the United States and China have a very strong motivation to humiliate Putin for entirely different reasons. Professor Nalapat, I, I, I just want to jog your memory. Uh, the February 2022, Russia invades um, Ukraine and the West imposes sanctions, crippling sanctions or so it hopes. Now, at that point of time, from that point up until now, China has been giving anything that Russia wants. In fact, Russia wanted some very high-tech chip technology, which China was giving quietly. And that is believed is the reason why the United States clamped down so hard on the fabs, on the technology, on anything. Now that has set China back by 10 to 15 years or probably longer in terms of semiconductor prowess. Now, let's, get, let's take a step back. Whatever Russia needed, China was sending. What was the trade uh, conducted in between those two countries, in your opinion? Was it rubles for Chinese goods or was it something else? Look, Sri, first of all, it's, prob it's probably RMB, if not ruble, probably RMB. And secondly, I'd like to make the point that the Chinese are experts, basically, at doing something as uh, putting, uh, you know, at, at uh, starting a fire and then saying we're going to put it out. But the, their satellite, uh, uh, the GHQ, is also an expert on that. I, we have said from 2022 onwards, I have been saying, the Chinese want this war to continue. They want this war to continue indefinitely until they can, quote unquote, settle the question of Taiwan, settle what they believe is the unfinished business of unification. And the most impressing unfinished business in their view is uh, the conquest of Taiwan. They would like this conflict to continue. So is it any surprise that they're helping Russia with whatever Russia needs to continue the conflict? I, I'm surprised that, you know, I mean, uh, anybody is surprised. You recall my conversations that the Chinese want this conflict to continue and continue and continue. So that the attention of NATO and the West is taken away from the Indo-Pacific, from Taiwan, and at that point in time, from, from the Himalayan Massif. Of course, the South China Sea, which is now a PRC lake. So they have a very clear interest in this conflict continuing. So please, uh, she, uh, you know, Jinping, 
the fact of the matter is that he obviously wants to keep Russia in the fight. If the West wins this battle, it's a defeat for China, a strategic defeat. It's not only a, a strategic defeat for Russia, it's a strategic defeat for China. And secondly, uh, it, then the West is basically ceased to be distracted. So the reality is they want the Russians to continue this conflict and they want to keep the pot boiling to ensure that the Russians don't, that they must be advising Russians, please be careful, please be careful. Now Putin is showing signs of impatience. He's talking about use of nuclear assets, etc. But they must be telling him, please be careful, please be careful. They'll be recording that and they'll be playing that back to people in Europe and Washington. Look, we have been trying our level best to get Putin to be careful, to get Putin to lay off. We are doing our best. They'll make umpteen calls to Ukrainian politicians, umpteen calls. Chinese diplomats will be all over Kiev. Uh, I mean, really, you know, with Ukrainian uh, uh, policy holders. They'll be doing all that, I can tell you. So the reality is they don't want Russia to win. They want basically the war to continue until they can finish this unfinished business, according to them, of Taiwan. So the country in the greatest danger, in my view, of this war continuing is Taiwan. Thank you, sir. Um, one, one episode that we did recently uh, in, in, on Peguru, just a few hours ago, in fact, was the proliferation of fake currency that appears to have the blessings of the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP itself, seems to be putting out these notes. And we have some evidence. Uh, one of our readers actually sent, uh, he went to an ATM in Shanghai a few years ago and he tried to withdraw 500 yuan. Four of those yuan notes were identical, including the serial number. And, and, and he panicked because he was on a visit from India. He thought that this is not legal currency if he has the same currency with four serial numbers, uh, four, 400 yuan notes, the same serial number. And, and he went to a bank there and the bank didn't even bat an eyelid. I said, this is common. So China essentially tries to make it look like it is not circulating as much yuan as is original, as is contended. And the way they get around this by, is by printing officially the same note four times. That is just a going number. Some could be five, some could be six. Now, you said that probably Russia paid for it with yuan. Sir, in, an, in a previous episode, one of my guests said that uh, Russia's oil that China wanted to get, they wanted, Russia wanted to be paid in euros. And, and that was a huge bone of contention because we know that China is scraping the barrel as far as having dollars or euros at this point of time. And this was not something that happened in one year. It has been happening for over a period of time. Why would Putin accept RMB, sir? If I know it, I'm sure FSB knows it. Why would he accept RMB, sir? I'm still having a difficulty trying to get this thing in my head that uh, you, Russia would accept RMBs. Uh, Sri, first of all, yeah, congratulations for that kind of discovery of multiple RMB notes. I'd like to point out that, as the, as you as you correctly said, it is these are all legal tender. They're not counterfeit. So they're all legal tender. So it doesn't matter whether they, they have you know, 20 of them with the same serial number, so long as they're not, uh, they're legal tender. And they're legal tender where, you know, where not only China is concerned, but a large zone where, in fact, the RMB, the Chinese are, are trying to slowly replace the US dollar with the use of the, of the renminbi. So that is uh, what is going on, if I may say so. So it, it doesn't make any kind of a, so far as Putin is concerned, euro. Now, what on earth will he do with the euros? He can't buy anything from Europe. Europe has basically shot itself in the foot uh, economically. Uh, it has done much more damage to itself than to Russia by these sanctions and by this war, quite frankly. Uh, what, it, it'll have euros which are basically uh, wallpaper because it, uh, Russia is Russia. Russian institution, Russian institution, Russian banks, Russian bank. They can't do anything with these euros. So why would they want euros? On the other hand, RMB will be used and can be used even in Europe and the United States. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Chancellor of Germany 
is probably on his way to China now. I think the I think if I may say so, the 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 the, the, UK, the president of France is probably you know uh, uh, going to go to China as well, and uh, it's only a matter of time before Rishi Sunak follows in their footsteps. So uh, quite frankly, uh, Sri, uh, I, I I can say it very very clearly that this. Please understand, this is not counterfeit currency. It is actually a huge supply of currency. Look at the supply of dollars. Look at how many dollars that have been in circulation which are hidden away. The Chinese want their RMB to be hidden away in mattresses. They want their RMB to become a store of value like the dollar is. And unlike, yeah, unlike the Americans and the Europeans, you're not going to destroy your own currency by imposing sanctions and basically scaring people from, from owning the currency. Today, the dollar, frankly, is in grave danger of, of a major reset because of the sanctions. Because it's not safe to hold a dollar anymore in so many geographical zones and so many mind spaces. So I'm sorry, uh, you know, Sri, but I don't think that argument is, is valid. Why would Putin uh, want RMB? Because it can get him a lot of stuff that he can't get with euros. He can get almost nothing with euros. Well, um, for what it's worth, uh, here is the the notes that we got from uh, a viewer of P Gurus. You can see up up on the up top half, you see four notes. They all had the same serial number, and on the bottom, we just picked out two of them and zoomed in. So you can see that exact same serial number is being uh, used. Professor Nalapad, I am sorry, I, I have a bit of a disagreement here in the sense that the West does not take the RMB, Ren, Mimbi or Yuan, whatever we want to call it, same thing, seriously. Most of the trade to the West, I would say about 80% uh, into China is happening using the Hong Kong dollar. And there is some sort of a, you can explain this, you are an economist too, you can wear that hat and tell me. What is the dealing between the Hong Kong dollar and the RMB? Because everybody seems to think everything is okay because the Hong Kong dollar is pegged to the United States dollar. But now Hong Kong is a completely subsumed territory of China. What is the relationship between Hong Kong dollar and RMB, sir? The Hong Kong dollar gives uh, uh, commercial entities in Europe and the United States a window to, to pretend that you're not basically going in for RMB. The fact is, the Hong Kong dollar has got a dollar peg. And now, the RMB, I've been saying for some time, the, the, the Chinese are looking at slowly devaluing the RMB so that their trade surplus can grow. The RMB has been falling in value relative to the US dollar, and their surpluses have been going, uh, going up. Their trade surplus have been uh, going up very significantly. So, the question is, will they change the the dollar peg with the RMB peg, they will not for a simple reason that you described, that this is now a very convenient window for making uh, 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 payments. You know, you say and receiving payment, you pay in Hong Kong dollars, which frankly is completely controlled by the Central Bank of China now. The Central the Hong Kong Bank has no autonomy left whatsoever. So essentially, it's a it's slate of hand. It's just an excuse, a fig leaf. And if I may say so, it's not the only fig leaf that is used by big powers and great powers to get around rules of their own making. Professor Nalapad, uh, let me ask you a question. So there is a Brahmastra available for the United States. Just take the, unpeg the Hong Kong dollar off of the US. Because I, I can't believe that the US is not aware of these multiple notes with the same serial number joke. Because if it is seven yuan to a dollar, and if you are printing four, of each yuan note, that's essentially 28 yuan to a dollar. We are not even talking about, uh, you know, making that 7 to 9. That is nothing. If you are, if you are making 4-4 four, four copies of the same currency, you are basically making a joke of your currency. Why should the United States keep honoring this Hong Kong dollar peg, sir? What is preventing the Biden administration from pulling the... Uh, um, uh, rug and from under the carpet of this this relationship because it was brought in when Hong Kong was going to become you know the two uh, two systems one country thing when they were going to secede from uh, 
uh, uh, United Kingdom. I think it was in 1993 this was put in place. 1997 the transfer went back to China. But they said that we are going to keep it for four, some 50 years. All that is gone. Nonsense. These people never honor any of their agreement. My question is, what is preventing the Biden administration from taking the Hong Kong dollar off of a US dollar peg? Sri, does, uh, does the United States control Hong Kong? No, it's it doesn't. Of the, yeah. United, of the Hong Kong Central Bank to adopt the, and the Hong Kong authorities, the authorities in the HKSAR, which is completely controlled now by the CCP, to adopt a dollar peg. Tomorrow, any country can adopt a dollar peg. And some countries have done so. So that decision is not the United States to take, that you will be a, a dollar peg. The second point is, please find me a market where you can get 15 uh, uh, you know, uh, for RMB for every dollar. You will see a trillion dollars enter that market in a matter of one hour, I can tell you. Look. This is an age of marketry. You can say that it is worth only 27 or 47 or 67. I can say it's worth 107 uh, to, to a US dollar. The markets price it differently. And you find me a market that can give you 15 RMB for every dollar. And I'm telling you a trillion dollars will flow to that market to get the RMB. So sorry, Shri, it's the a, it's a market at work. And the market till today, the Chinese are masters at market manipulation. I have said for a long time that, you know, I mean, in, normally the price of a product is determined by the cost of the factors of production. In China, the, the factors, the price of the factors of production is determined by the price. The price at which they can outsell any competitor and they make sure the factors of production that go into it are priced in such a way that this becomes that this becomes possible. So the Chinese have got a unique authoritarian system, and that is keeping this particular level of the RMB uh, at where it is. You're saying seven and a half, eight. My own view is it'll fly, fly slowly, start drifting to about nine or ten. If there's a pressure uh, on on Chinese trade, if the trade deficit starts, you know, with other countries creates in them withdrawing from the Chinese, uh, you know, uh, I mean as a source of supply. That's not happened yet. It should happen. And one of the ways the Chinese are keeping it from happening is a softening RMB. But tell me one location where you can get the, the kind of value you are saying for a US dollar as compared to RMB. Well, um, I think we can go on on this debate, but I think we should get back to the original topic, which was the role of Pakistan's deep state in uh, this uh, whole Moscow thing. Pakistan has been supplying arms and ammunition as well as some drones, which is unbelievable that Pakistan makes drones to Ukraine. That's what people say. So wrap it up here for us. What should India expect from all this stuff? And, and uh, how do you see the war go? Is it going to end tomorrow? Because the Maidan revolution happened, then Crimea annexation happened. Move, counter move. Can I say that? Of course. So now, now you have the Russian invasion. What is going to be the counter move from the West? Uh, the point is, the West has basically exhausted almost all the arrows in its quiver. How many more sanctions are you going to put on Russia? You've already sanctioned them. Uh, more than, I think, a thousand sanctions are on Russia. Well, where are the additional sanctions? Is the Russian economy collapsing? Is the ruble collapsing? No. And why? Well, because the global West does not buy the Western narrative on Ukraine at all. They don't regard Ukraine as a central question facing humanity. The global West has completely moved away from the West as a consequence of the, of the, the, the complete absorption of the West in Ukraine. And in Biden also, you see the enormous support he has lost among uh, uh, African-American voters and Hispanic voters, Black Americans and Hispanics. Biden came to power on the back of the back of the black and Hispanic vote. Is Ukraine black? Is Ukraine Hispanic? Uh, Biden begins a State of the Union address, which is meant to appeal to a US voter. And he begins and basically goes on to a monologue about Ukraine. He's obsessed with Ukraine. I, I, the, the, now it's very clear to blacks, to Latinos, to practically, you know, to all these groups 
that Biden is not interested in us as much as interested in Ukraine. And they're buying into the conspiracy theory. I don't believe Biden is a racist. I don't believe his, anybody in his family is racist. The conspiracy theory is Biden is secretly a white supremacist. All he cares for uh, are, are white countries. Ukraine is white. So that he's bothered only about Ukraine. And may I tell you, this opinion has spread throughout the global south. And I'm sure it's spread among the black and Latino communities uh, in the United States that Biden only cares for the Ukrainians because they are white and he doesn't care for anybody else. He's draining U.S. money because they are white people. It's, a, it's, a, it's not correct. It's wrong, but it's hurting Biden. This war is costing Biden the election. So tell us one thing. I would it would be remiss of me not uh, not to ask this question. Why was Victoria Newland eased out? In my my guess, and and remember, uh, Sunday Guardian is the newspaper that first exposed the fact that the fact that it takes nine hundred days for an Indian to get a visa, and four days for a, a Chinese to get a visa. Uh, well, uh, I, we exposed that. And thereafter, I think very quickly, you know, then of course, excuses were made. It'll take years and years to iron out. But today, I'm happy to tell you a few, uh, a the United States got into action. The Biden administration got into to a hyperactive mode. They realized the immense damage this is doing to India-US relations. And now, I'm happy to say, the United States is where visas are concerned, one of the most efficient countries in the world. They're far more efficient than the European Union, among the worst locations, you know, the places to get a visa for an Indian is Schengen visa. Why? Because frankly, I think they still have that mentality. You know, the, 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 what do I, what do I say? The, the master race and this, and the, and this, and the slave races, you know, the, you know, and this, and as a consequence, it's so difficult to get a Schengen visa for so many people who would, would never want to settle down there. But the people who are settling down there are people without visas. So you deny access to the, uh, the good people and you get people without visas. I said this 20 years ago in the United States. I wrote, I think, in UPI or some other publication that you guys are blocking people from Chennai and Hyderabad. And what's going to happen? All kinds of people are going to come in without a visa, without anything. And you're going to be flooded with them. Whereas people from Chennai and Hyderabad will give you taxes. They'll be model citizens and you're keeping them out. The same thing is happening in Europe. It's so difficult to get a Schengen visa. And, you know, and the fact is, they should be welcoming people from India with open arms. Thank you so much, Professor Nalapad. We have a few questions from our viewers. If you don't mind, shall we take them? Of course. Thank you. Thank you, Tota Totaka456 Jano Kiraman. Thank you so much for becoming a YouTube member. Partha wants to know, what is your view on alternative locomotive fuels? While hybrids and EVs are great, can we shift to hydrogen and ethanol? And if yes, uh, Partha, this is out of syllabus. Let's not take this thing because we are talking about geopolitics here. Um, uh, Lakshan, I uh, uh, am a dunce in this question. I wouldn't <laughs> be it. Let's be honest. <laughs> Sorry, Partha. Um, Lakshan wants to know, what is Britain's role in all these five eyes stuff? Do they know and hence illogically have a break? EU at war with Russia. That is EU at war with Russia. Look, uh, the five eyes, I mean, they're as good as the intel they get. And uh, in my personal view, you should be seven eyes. Japan and India should be added to the five eyes. I have nothing against the five eyes except to say that apart from ethnic grounds, apart from the fact that, you know, both the, that there's a common ethnicity binding most people in the U.S., and Europe. There's no reason why Japan and, and India should not be part of the Five Eyes. Now, frankly, as far as Brexit is concerned, well, it hasn't really worked out the way the, the Brexiteers, Boris Johnson and others thought it will work out, mainly because the British, even after Brexit, they, they, they should have planned Brexit and done Brexit after preparing the ground. They first do Brexit and then they jump and realize they have they have jumped into a deep pond and then we have to learn to swim. And how they are learning to swim. I must say Rishi Sunak has done a pretty good job of navigating uh, uh, I mean, the, the waters. Much better job than Johnson. 
poor Liz Truss was not allowed to do a good job. But Johnson did an awful job. And EU at war with Russia, I think it's quite obvious. It is at war with Russia. Absolutely. I mean, this fiction that, you know, Ukraine is, a, is, is functioning because of the EU and unfortunately also because of, of the United States, but mainly the EU. It is a de facto war with Russia. It's not a de jure war with Russia. And that is my worry that one day Vladimir Putin, whom you're, you know, humiliating, insulting, attacking in various ways, not just verbally, and now through very, I mean, through various means, one day the man may say, all right, let me be, you know, uh, in a direct war with, with, with Europe. Let's say he attacks a Baltic state. Let's say he attacks, he drops a tactical nuclear weapon uh, on, uh, on, a, on an aircraft, you know, supply site in Poland. What, is, what are you going to do? I have asked this question from 19, 20, 2022 onwards. What are you going to do? You can't fight the most foremost nuclear power in the world if it decides to use that weapon against you. The only authority that is left is moral. And if you tear your moral authority to shreds, which are, unfortunately is happening, um, different countries are doing it. It's not just uh, you know the United States or the EU that's doing it or the UK. The Chinese are doing it. There are, I mean, a lot of countries are doing it. But the reality is, my worry is that this the EU believes it can keep away from direct war with Russia. If Putin calls the bluff of Article 5 of NATO and attacks a NATO country, what is the EU going to do against a nuclear weapons power? I think Putin will wait till the uh, till after the US elections and also um, about uh, United Kingdom politics. If elections were to be held today in United Kingdom, it is believed that the conservatives would get less than 100 seats. I think the parliament is uh, 600 something. So it's, it's going to be a massive defeat for the conservatives. So we'll have to wait and see what happens because already things are quite bad in UK. It is being run over because of its liberal uh, policies for illegals once they land uh, on their shores. And if the labor comes to power, God save UK, UK is gone. Anyway, that's all I can say. Next question, please. Uh, Manof San wants to know, Prasthan Nalapath, is Newland another Robin Raphael and how can India insulate itself from such deep state stuntsmen? By, by exposing them, uh, frankly, by exposing them as Sunday Guardian exposed Newland as being the brain behind this uh, visa denial scheme. Now, Robin Raphael hated India. She was in love with Pakistan. There was a guy called Shafkar Kakakhel in Pakistan. And Robin Raphael and Shafkar Kakakhel were friendly with each other. I'm not going to go further than that. Except to say her they were very got, Sir, her husband got uh, gunned down along with uh, Zia ul Haq on that plane. Look, I'm How only saying... How can you still be in love? <laughs> I, 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 was he gunned down by Shafkat Kakakhel? I didn't know. Shafkat Kakakhel was a, was a very charming guy. Pashtun chap. Very charming chap. And back in the 90s, he and Robin were inseparable. And a lot of her inspiration for attacking India came. Victoria Nolan is an obsession with Russia. Absolute obsession with Russia. You know, e even if there's a war with China, she will still say the way to victory is basically by keeping on attacking Russia. She's obsessed with Russia. So she, she's another Robin Raphael in the sense she's also obsessed. And if I may say so, I mean, both men and women among policymakers are obsessed. I mean, you know, we've got, we're discussing two women, but the fact is a lot of men are also Russia obsessed. And Biden, for example, is Russia obsessed, frankly. And uh, so the difference is Robin Raphael was obsessed against India. And uh, Newland was obsessed against Russia. And she, as the published data, proven data show, she worked very hard to ensure that Ukraine developed into a proxy state that would wage war on behalf of NATO against Russia. This was... Pretty from 2014, definitely, most likely from even earlier, 2011 or so, it was very clear that Ukraine was being, in a sense, you know, primed for that role. And some of us who thought that Zelensky would not fall for that trap, we, are, we were disappointed that he did fall for that trap. And I'm sorry to say, the people of Ukraine have suffered terribly. 
they're some of the nicest people in the world and they're wonderful people and the extent of suffering they've been through uh, since 2022 since this war started is just indescribable uh next question please and this is the last one so has wants to know professor nalapa will the dollar value against the inr become less than 30 over the next two years after the outburst of the recession look uh, frankly, so, uh, so long as the U.S. dollar survives, the U.S. government's policies and the Federal Reserve's policies against it, uh, U.S. dollar will definitely have uh, the, the, the dollar value. Well, the Federal Reserve, I mean, if it you know, lower, if the, you know, the point is the dollar is now a standard store of value. We have all seen the danger of crypto. We have all seen how crypto, I mean, you know, you can have dollars, you can have crypto, any currency used uh, for bad purposes. I'm not going to tar crypto with that brush. But certainly, it's quite a volatile market. And that being the case, the dollar is relatively stable. It's never been, even though uh, counterfeiting of the dollar is so common, it's never been, if I may say so, demonetized. Never once have has the United States Federal Reserve demonetized the dollar. So it's not going to be a situation where you keep stuff your dollars under a mattress and one day they demonetize and they come out in a different color. You know, it's, it's never happened. It's unlikely to happen. But that being the case, I think the, the dollar has got its value, not because of its intrinsic value, because of its value to other countries, to holders of the dollar, external holders of the dollar. And so long as there are external holders of the dollar, the dollar will have and over, it will be an overvalued asset. And so long as we have, a, you know, in India, we have a policy that basically favors an undervaluation of the rupee uh, for the purpose of trade. Frankly, I believe 30 to a, a dollar is would be an ideal uh, uh, benchmark to reach and will be good for the economy. But the central bank doesn't agree with me and has not agreed with me for several decades. So uh, I, as of now, frankly, it should be the right value. But I doubt it's going to be a right value. And I think the reason is the Central Bank of India is still completely export uh, obsessed and keeping the value of the rupee, you know, uh, not, not floating up too much. As far as dollar is concerned, it's still, despite all the blows that the, that the sanctions have done to it by Obama and by, by Biden, it is still uh, the currency of choice for those who want to hold currency, except individuals in target countries. These individuals will be removing the dollar and probably buying up crypto. And the fact that they're possibly buying up crypto may be one reason for the sudden escalation in the price of crypto. You know, uh, from my economics class, uh, from my economics class, when I used to study engineering, there are a couple of classes that you take for economics. You know, uh, there's one saying that I've always remembered. Money is a matter of functions for a medium a measure, a standard, a store. Those of us who think that any other currency can, uh, you know, replace the dollar, have to pay attention to the last part, a store. What would you like to store if there's a nuclear holocaust tomorrow? Which currency are you going to keep? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, you have a lot of people in Pakistan who are completely behold in China. Check how many of the children are studying in China. Check how many houses they have, they, have, they have bought in Shanghai or Beijing. None. None. They're all in the United States, frankly. So I quite agree with you. I don't think anybody would be jumping to the Chinese uh, I mean, boat anytime soon. The America is still a much better country to live in. It's still a much friendlier country. And let's be honest, democracy counts. Freedom counts. And you know, I'm not saying that you're perfect. But certainly, you're way, way, way better than the PRC. Thank you so much, sir. That was 49, 50 minutes of pure Gyan viewers. Uh, those of you who have not had a chance to watch it, or if you are confused about some of the things we talked about, you may want to watch it again. Professor Nalapat is a, a, a big fount of information. And we've, caught, we've, we've traversed a lot of topics here, even though we were discussing one topic. The reason for that is that everything is right now tightly coupled. And, and this is the way things are going to be for a few more years, a few more decades. Who knows? Thank you so much, Professor Nalapat. And viewers, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to click on the bell button for notifications. Namaskar. Jai Hind.
Thank you.